Ladies and gentlemen, our next panel, Accessing Innovation Capital. Please welcome to the stage moderator Marcus Weisgerber and our distinguished panelists. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, afternoon panel, Access Accessing Innovation Capital, which is a very timely discussion, obviously, in wake of uh, a bunch of the activities uh, involving Silicon Valley Bank in the last uh, week or so. So um, that's gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about that and a number of other things. I'm Marcus Weisgerber. I'm from Defense One, where I write about the intersection of business and national security, and I want to thank uh, the Reagan, uh, Reagan folks for inviting me to moderate, especially Rachel and there's Roger over there. Um, I want to quickly introduce our panelists and then we will dive right into it. So we'll start with next to me, naturally the order I do not have it in, <laughs> jo Jonathan Burks, he's Vice President of Global Public Policy at Walmart and former House Speaker Paul Ryan's Chief of Staff and probably very relevant to this audience, he is a commissioner on the Commission on Planning, Programming, Budgeting and Execution. PPB and E reform. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for joining us. Uh, Michael, Michael Madsen, the acting director of the Defense Innovation Unit, the arm of the Pentagon that most closely works with startups and emerging technology companies. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. And lastly, Alex Moore, partner at 8VC, a venture firm that builds itself as, quote, a technology and life sciences investment firm that builds and invests in the world's most ambitious companies. Alex, thanks for joining us. So. <coughs> We'll dive right in. And Mike, we will start with you. Last Friday, as I mentioned, we saw the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, which reportedly provides financial services for about half of US startups. So just from where you sit, kind of what's your assessment of this? And what are the companies that uh, the startups that you're working with telling, telling you about how they're being impacted by this? Uh, yeah, thanks, Marcus. Yeah, it, it was a busy weekend, um, for sure. Um, and so what we did, um, we, we had three major concerns initially, three very short-term, uh, near-term concerns for a lot of the companies we work with. And one of them was a concern that they were going to have to halt work uh, with us, direct, uh, direct just uh, shut down operations with us. We peeled that back and started to get concerned with uh, indirect uh, uh, impacts, uh, uh, impacts of supply chain for maybe not a direct, uh, direct impact, but uh, some secondary issues there. Um, and then we were also concerned as we, we started looking into it, concerned uh, with uh, uh, financial, uh, for the financial issues. And if companies came under financial distress, uh, would they take on um, drastic measures and put IP at risk, for example? Uh, and so we were concerned about that. Um, and then the last one was continued uncertainty. As we started to see some other banks uh, kind of fall, we, we started to get concerned with, you know, what was that going to be in the bigger picture? So then our first action was to reach out to our companies and really start to assess, well, what is the real exposure risk? Um, is it payroll? Is it uh, other things? And how is that going to be impacted uh, and manifested there? And then we started charting a, a course of action. Uh, so looking at we could leverage uh, existing authorities, for example, to accelerate milestones uh, and make sure that we could provide some sort of uh, fluid stream of capital uh, to meet their short-term needs. Um, and then uh, the third thing that we looked at to help alleviate some of those concerns was to uh, start thinking about linkages between some of the commercial capital providers we've worked with in the past that we had great relationships with that might be able to step up and help at least in a short-term uh, situation to provide some, some bridge funding there. So did you have to did you have to do any of that? Did you have no? And then of course uh, we got the word from the FDIC and Treasury uh, late on Sunday. But interestingly, um, you're right because it brings up a, a much broader strategic question of um, you know how how can we exercise something like that so that um, we can demonstrate the linkage between economic security and national security and let our national security innovation base uh, participants know that that we are a partner. Um, you know, when we're getting the, the goods and services and technology from them flowing into the department, but also in situations like that that are uh, unforeseen and how we can assist in those situations. And probably lastly, it, it, w as you think about the future and, you know, potential of something to happen again, I, th I think one of our panelists this morning mentioned that, you know, they went from it was six hours between the time when they uh, found out about what was going on and then were locked out of getting their money. Are there any steps that the Pentagon can take, should take, would take? Is that something you're considering to be able to do some of those things you, you, you talked about if you need to give bridge, bridge funding or something like that? Well, I think um, you have to put it in a broader context. And I think it is 
uh, taking this opportunity to really get serious about growing that connective tissue between the national security enterprise and uh, the commercial uh, capital <laughs> markets, make sure there's some connection there, uh, and show that we're good uh, and sophisticated partners. Um, of course, the Office of Strategic Capital stood up. Uh, they have a, a very compatible and complementary capability uh, with DIU, so we work closely with them at all the various stages of, of development uh, to make sure that we're bridging those valleys where we need to, uh, but also making sure that we're illuminating a path to the defense marketplace. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk about the Office of Strategic Capital a little bit later. Alex, let's pivot to you. Kind of, uh, what, what, what have, uh, last Friday's uh, actions, what, what, is, what have you been hearing from the companies that you're uh, invested in and yeah. uh, part of your portfolio? Yeah, I think it was just general confusion. Um, and, you know, Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank's been a very dynamic partner for startups for, for decades. So, shock, uh, personalities come out. Some CEOs call you five times in a day. Some don't call you. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think it was our, our thought was you let Silicon Valley fail, then First Republic's going to fail on Monday. So it's, it's like one of those things where um, I think it was clearly the right thing to do. Um, but, yeah, there would have been a lot, a lot of, you know, even more risk sort of coming out into this week if they didn't move really quick. Really quick. So I think it was the right thing to do. How do you think this is going to impact uh, – VC investing, short term. VCs, yeah. The, so, so, like, macro piece, low interest rates past decade, I think VCs have been less less hardcore on the fiduciary duty they have to their investors. Um, ABC takes that seriously. We've actually, we actually incubated a company called Standard Metrics, which, uh, through, through banking APIs, pulls out banking-level data into... Uh, um, automatic reports that the investors see. So we've built technology actually sol solves uh, the fiduciary issue. But I think basically, like interest rates high, um, everyone's being very diligent now. So I think there's like this stuff's bad, but there's some health that gets reintroduced to this thing. Where like the VC's job isn't just to be like the cheerleader to the entrepreneur. It's like also give them discipline or, or help them make their way to be a public company, which is you know the business we're in. So. I think this is just another gut check um, that will kind of wake up, wake up the, the, the community a little more. Um, yeah, and it's just like too bad. Like this, we, Silicon Valley Bank are nice people, and you know maybe they, they, they did not position correctly here. But um, but yeah, show goes on. Jonathan, how how do you think policymakers should react to? Or if, if at all. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, appropriate that uh, the federal government stepped in to provide liquidity uh, in this instance because of the downstream effects. Uh, but I think it probably also points to uh, a need for better regulation upstream uh, because ultimately the, the failure of SVP was about a liquidity um, mismatch, which isn't new to banking. Um, so this was the kind of thing that um, regulation is actually reasonably well suited to. Um, address beforehand, and I think um, we all, um, as citizens, will be well served by looking, um, taking a look back and seeing where that failure was in this instance, um, and making sure that the regime is appropriate um, going forward. Okay, so break, break. Now we could go to where we were actually planning to go from the beginning uh, on Friday when we, or before Friday. Uh, Mike, let's turn over to you. Uh, DIU created, I believe, the turns eight this year. I was with. Uh, Bob work when he went out there uh, and actually I don't think I was even allowed to go in the office because there was something like classified or something where in the location where it was at the time we went out to Moffett Field and then went over to op op open the off uh, office when he was Deputy Defense Secretary. Anyway, um, how do you assess how, D how DIU is it right now and just attracti attracting startups and um, what, just kind of what, what's the mood right now? I know, you know we've heard from some folks here today. Um, how, how has that mood changed? I know you've been there for about five years. How has the mood changed, if at all, in the five years? Yeah, so our, our most important metric is our transition rate. And our transition rate is about 50%. Um, and that's transition from prototype to production. And we have a pretty stringent definition. We don't buy commercial off the shelf. We buy commercial solutions, do some customization, prove that through prototyping, and then field that technology. Um, so uh, our, our definition is uh, the technology has to work, the customization has to work. There has to be a funding mechanism in place, uh, contract, and then there has to be money available. So it's pretty clear. 
uh, and that's about 50%. I um, think it should be a little bit higher. Certainly not 100%. We wouldn't be taking enough risk. But um, let's back up a little bit and put it in, uh, in context. Just briefly, DIU uh, is a SECDEF initiative to uh, lower the barriers to entry to the defense marketplace for non-traditional companies that are leading edge of technology development. Um, we're a little bit different. Our business model more closely matches a commercial product development cycle. Uh, we use a competitive process called a commercial solutions opening so we can transition from prototype uh, right to production if the prototype was awarded under our, our competitive means uh, like that. Um, and we always start with the transition in mind. And really, ultimately, what is success for us is fielding leading edge technology, getting that in the hands of the men and women in uniform at scale. Uh, but also recognizing our, our other uh, stakeholders on the supply side, illuminating a path to the defense marketplace, but more importantly, illuminating a path to recurring revenue. Uh, some of our partners in the uh, venture capital world have indicated that prototype contracts are, are great uh, and a first step, but what they're really interested in when they're doing valuations of companies is uh, that recurring revenue, those production contracts. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's really how we uh, measure success is that transition. And as we also look at our um, increase in projects that we're doing, we have an increase in project throughput, which tells me we're showing value to our DOD partner on the demand signal. Uh, and we also have more solicitations from our commercial partners. So we're showing demand up to them that we have streamlined uh, the process and made that uh, work a little bit quicker. So, uh, what, so I guess, what are some initiatives that, you know, to, to help that transition or get that transition rate up to navigate this so-called, you know, valley, valley of death. Uh, do, do you have any new initiatives that you're taking to try to, to bridge that, or, or is, is it, um, no, you tell us what it is. <laughs> you like bet. That. Well, one of, the, one of the keys is that we, while every project is rooted in a services requirements, it's really based on a problem statement, where we break down the requirement into a simply stated half page or paragraph problem statement. We get rid of the Pentagon jargon. We get rid of the acronyms and just explain the problem that we're trying to solve. And that really has become something that uh, has been uh, really illuminating to me is that we, and this is a common theme from today, that we don't articulate what we need very well. In fact, we had a project that was uh, developing a, a drone for deployment with uh, squad level individual um, soldiers. It took six years to write a 60-page requirements document. And then, because we don't work in parallel, we work in series, then it goes into the, the budgeting process. So we're talking a decade from identifying what we need, writing 60 pages, and then planning. I mean, we could probably whip something out in here in like, what, five, 10 minutes, us, a paragraph maybe, explain what it was. So we basically go to the commercial sector and say, hey, help us solve this problem. Um, the other thing we did is we stood up a team focused on our demands and our, our uh, defense team. Um, Ellen Lord mentioned earlier today that everything in D.C. is a campaign. That is so true. Um, I always kind of <laughs> chuckle when uh, early stage companies think they can go engage a four-star general in the Pentagon and she whips out her checkbook and she writes a check <laughs> and, and they're off to the races. It doesn't work that way. It is a complete strategy and campaign. And so that's what our defense engagement team does is we understand the problem. Uh, but then we also work with the command structure, uh, the programmatic structure, and the end users really to make sure that uh, we've covered all of those bases. Jonathan, what are you, you know? You're on the, the like I said, the PPBE commission. Uh, I suspect some of the so you've gotten some suggestions from folks on how to better transition, and you know, the, not even just small small you know tech startups, but just across the board. I guess what are some of the suggestions you guys have? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I'm sure you guys are all tired of hearing about the PPB Reform Commission. You've heard from, I think, six commissioners in total, right, Ellen, um, uh, today. And, you know, I think we've heard a lot uh, from industry. And we want to hear more. So the, the door is open uh, to any good ideas that are out there or um, any problems you've had. We want to hear about it uh, because ultimately uh, we think there's a real upside inside the building for reform. Um, you know, and I think one of the things we've heard a lot about is just the timelines. Um, you know, the, the 10 years that uh, you cite uh, is sort of an extreme example, but it's the same sort of uh, thing where even a routine, uh, you know, getting from uh, into the program into the budget cycle is 24 months. 
uh, you know, before you actually get funded. And so uh, the need for figuring out how to shorten those timelines, think about how to add more opportunities for flexibility, add more opportunities for adjustments um, later in the process so that you, know, you can meet warfighter needs um, more closely um, aligned to when the money's going to become available is uh, one of the things that we're wrestling with. And you know, I don't want to presage, uh, prejudge any um, recommendations that we'll have, but it, it's something that we're intensely focused on. Actually, can I, can I pick yeah. up and, and riff on that a little bit? Um, I had a chance to talk to the PPBE uh, Reform Commission some time ago, and what I think is fantastic is, um, you know, PPBE is, of course, you think of that funding uh, part of it, but when you think of the, the three legs of that stool of procurement that um, we just heard about, um, they're not just taking the funding in that stovepipe of excellence, but considering the requirements piece of it, as well as the acquisition uh, reform that's already taken place. We've seen a lot of energy around acquisition reform, more around budget, not so much around requirements. But uh, I think it's fantastic that they're, they're understanding the interplay of those three uh, legs of the stool. Yeah, and I think it's uh, one of the things that uh, one of our commissioners has been very focused on making sure we don't forget is that ultimately uh, there is a need for a PPB-like process um, that really does take the defense strategy and translates it into an executable um, budget program. So even as we go through and try to make it more efficient, allow for more changes, allow for more flexibility, we need to keep those, those core elements that do allow us to um, you know, be sensible about how we're expending you know, 800 plus billion dollars a year. Is the commission looking at anything involving training? And I, I, th I think back to when Ellen was uh, at ANS and you know, a, lot, a lot, I remember her and for her, Frank Kendall and Bill LaPlante all saying stuff like, you know, the authorities exist to buy things quickly. It's just a matter of having the training of the workforce and the people who are willing to take the risk and, and, and do it. Yeah, you know, I think we've had a, a conversation earlier today about culture. Um, I think that's, uh, from my standpoint, certainly something that um, can be an inhibition uh, to taking advantage of some of the authorities that do exist. Um, and then one of the charges of the commission is looking at uh, workforce efficiency and workforce training. And so that's something that we're uh, certainly uh, working on. And um, I believe that's going to be part of our interim report, um, uh, which is, will be out later this summer. So. Alex, how do investors feel about it taking 10 years to buy a drone? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. My basic thesis on uh, defense investing is that, which is a little contrarian, but I think true, um, is that it takes a billion dollars with a B in private capital to to build a defense company in this environment. And so, <coughs> Andrew did it right. So that that's about how much it took them. Uh, Palantir, where I was an early employee, also probably raised about a billion dollars to get going. And like. That is relating to the, the valley of death, how severe these problems are. Um, two, you want to have um, a company that maybe can make more than one type of product. So, my, you know, so I get on the phone with um, three, this is the good news, I think, for the room, three different firms a week. We want to get into defense. How do we do it? Um, and so what they're doing now, which, which, is, which doesn't work, um, is they're pursuing a model we're familiar with for software investing, which, which I call like 2, 10, and 20, where <coughs> I'll see the company, it's like a little hacker group, 2 million, they're going to go build something, sell a million bucks worth of it, come back, we'll give you 10, do it again, here's 30, we got a software company. Uh, so they're, they're practicing this type of financing, and then I think what we're going to have actually is, um, and hopefully less so with, with a reform on the acquisition side, uh, a, a generation of startups that fail. Um, because they don't have the sophistication or the coordination it takes to raise a billion dollars with a B. It's really hard to do. So what, I'm, what I kind of describe, I describe this problem to the investors, um, and I sort of say, hey, we gotta, we got to kind of team up. Let's work together, and maybe we can build one big one a year. Right? So people call me, you know, you're the defense guy, blah, blah, blah. How many companies have you invested in? And I say, basically four. Right? And we, have 100, we put $100 million in each one. Um, and like that kind of large scale investing what <coughs> is not optimizing for like maximum innovative output from what Silicon Valley is really good at. Silicon Valley is really good at making like hundreds of companies and then you get Google out of it or, or, or something. Um, so that's the level of severity that's like where it's broken. Um, the good news is like, you know, we did get an Android out of it. Um, we have three or four others I think could be sort of like the next Android type companies. Um, <coughs> but that's, 
that's the, what I call the investment geometry. That's very broken. So, um, so we'll have the good news. So good news, bad news takes a billion dollars. Good news, um, every single firm wants to get into defense right now. Right? They, they're, I'm getting called like never before, um, and that's within. I think that's within the past year. I think that's probably people watching the success of an Anderol. Um, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. But, but like, my, you know, my understanding of how to build these companies is you want to build, you want to build the future, you know, prime contractor. You want to build the next Raytheon, the next Lockheed. So, you know, you're going to need a, maybe a few different products, a few different shots on goal. You're going to need a DC lobbying group that, that, that's yours and then helps describe what you're doing uh, to DC. And then you're going to need a lot of really amazing engineers. So all of that is, is uh, that, that's, the, that's the current paradigm. So, is it, so that billion goes toward yeah. that getting those lobbyists, get, you know, or, or is it also partly just Mostly the Pentagon deals and lot, their money, you know, if anything, you know, millions of dollars to the Pentagon is pennies, essentially, to other government agencies. So is it just to be taken I think it's seriously? A it, it, it's a comment. Yeah, I think this is that, but I think it's also accommodating the, this temporal challenge where um, there, there are these longer sales cycles. That's what the software people are not used to, right? They're, so these, these, you know, we have a group of software investors that are going to get educated on, on, on how this stuff works. Um, but again, people adapt. I think also as you, I'm optimistic, right? That's, you know, I can invest in anything. I, I spend all my time on defense. Um, I think the, 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 the movement on um, reform and, you know, folks like DIU really help hold down the ecosystem. And the nurturing um, of these small startups is, is like that ecosystem is, is gaining st strength rapidly. So I think like putting this all together, we're probably headed towards something where hopefully it becomes a little easier uh, to start these companies. And then with the end goal of creating like, instead of having like, you know, maybe we have like five big prime contractors now, like let's have 10. Right in like fifteen in, in ten or fifteen years from now, there should be five new ones. That's that would be the goal from the VC side, right? Uh, Mike, I want to ask you. Uh, we we mentioned the Office of Strategic Capital earlier. I believe um, a lot of budget numbers have been are swirling in my head, but it got over a hundred million dollars in the budget request for twenty four. Just kind of so, what? Just could you talk about your relationship, and you know how you know. Or I presume they'll be a part of helping you transition programs like you talked about doing earlier. Or yeah, it's a, a complementary capability for sure um, along all phases of technology development. They have a, a handful of different mechanisms. I think they're working on some uh, congressional language for uh, 24, so we'll see if that uh, comes to fruition. But um, we've had a very close relationship from developing the concept uh, all the way to where we are now. But I think one area to really focus on is one area they're going to uh, look at providing capital is on some uh, very early stage technology that doesn't necessarily have a programmatic home. Um, and that's one of the things that we found as part of our fast follower strategy, and that's to be a fast follower uh, where the commercial sector is leading, be an initial adopter uh, where we have to be. A lot of these emerging technologies don't necessarily have a programmatic home um, in the department. So it's hard to go uh, say, I wouldn't even want to buy some overhead imagery at, at you know, location uh, X. And that's, so that's one of the things that we're also um, looking at getting after uh, through the fast follower strategy, which was outlined in the National Defense uh, Strategy last year. Um, we're proud that DIU is one of the first entities that uh, really came up with it. And hat tip to Mike Brown, right over here, the former, uh, former director, who is really the, uh, driving that uh, through the department. Uh, before we get to audience questions in the room, uh, I figured we could talk about the uh, Reagan Institute's the National Security Innovation Base Report Card that came out yesterday. Um, I'll note that the highest grade was an A minus, and it went to innovation leadership. So I guess that's you. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And I'd reflect that right back here too. Well, it's pretty yep. much all of DIU in that uh, that row. Yep. <laughs> um, so. so two of the recommendations in there that I'd, I'd love to get probably all, th all three panelists' thoughts on are the need to uh, foster stronger relationships with the private investment community and make bigger, bolder, and more flexible investments in new capabilities. So um, maybe, Mike, we'll start with you and then pivot back to Jonathan and over to Alex. Yeah. What, do you, uh, what, what, can be, what, what can be done to address those 
two well, recommendations? I, I think uh, a couple of things. One of them is, again, to clearly articulate what we need to buy and figure out where that line of demarcation is on the, on the, the procurement line, submarines and aircraft carriers, copy your paper over here. At some point in there, we can just say, hey, look, we need you know, whatever and get that from the commercial sector. So be much more clear uh, about that. Um, work on adequate and consistent funding. Um, and the consistent funding is probably as important as the um, uh, adequate funding. Um, CRs and those kind of things where, where it's just not consistent year to year is really a challenge. Um, and then I think uh, the other thing I hit on it before is to illuminate that path to recurring revenue. Uh, we've heard throughout the day that uh, the big push is to get to production. How do we get to production? Um, that's one of our initiatives in 23 is to um, engage with the services and the programmatic offices um, to be able to be part of that conversation when they're developing the acquisition strategy and articulate the state of the art of the commercial technology. Um, and then also get serious about uh, modular, uh, doing things in a modular fashion um, where we can on those big programs, um, look at it doing it in a modular way so that we can pull in, we can show on-ramps um, to uh, some of this emerging technology, um, and then not also get in vendor lock, but be able to uh, to go back and get the the next next year's leading developer to uh, to be able to participate as well. Yeah, and you know I think picking up on the need for stable uh, funding, you know I think one of the challenges that we've seen obviously over the last decade plus in um, uh, defense spending is that we've not gotten appropriations on time except for one year, um, which just happened to when uh, uh, Speaker Ryan was in charge, but, you know, mere coincidence. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so we don't get time spending in time, uh, and we haven't had sort of a clear picture of what the, the top line would look like. Um, you know, and, and those are both areas that in terms of um, this year's uh, deficit, uh, or excuse me, debt, um, uh, limit fight that's underway. Uh, hopefully we can come out of that with at least some sense of what the, the defense top line looks like over a number of years, um, and hopefully it provides a pathway for uh, sort of getting back to closer to regular order and appropriations so that, again, um, you can get uh, the stability you need in funding. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, anything that shortens timelines, immediate expansion of programs like DIU and AppWorks, the CBER programs, take the award from two to 10 million because two million is not enough for a VC firm to underwrite a company on revenue, 10 million is. We'll bring out you know, the, the whole parade for that. So anything getting startups to that 10 million number faster is good. And then there's huge leverage. Like you, know, you look at Shield AI just raised 500 million, presumably on a much smaller amount of contracts that they had booked, I, I would assume. Um, but that's like that's leverage. So it's like the, the, the federal dollar, then like you're gonna get a 10x from VC dollar. You put 10 million on revenue on that, I can go raise 50 from all these people calling me. How do I do it? Um, now you got $60 million in, in, a, in, a, in an engineering firm with really smart engineers. You can, you can change the world with that. Um, so that's how, much, that's, that's how easy it is, or that's how much power like the federal government has. It's like, just open that aperture just a bit it doesn't have, we don't need 100 million, we just need 10 to start it. And then the, the capital will do its thing. So I think there is this like really strong, really developed mechanism um, VCs have. Um, and, and, and almost I'm describing a paradigm where they want to overinvest in defense right now, right? That let, let these people donate money uh, uh, to this industrial, you know, to, to innovation here. Um, and, and, you know, some things will work, some, some won't. Um, and then two, there's just a, a movement now where long run, like these are like software wars more and more. I mean, there, there's the hardware you can never take away, the kinetics, all, all that, all tanks, stuff like that. Uh, but software is like what Silicon Valley is good at, right? Like that's what, that's what they're undisputed the best at, right? Um, not building aircraft carriers, but things that involve software. I have these little drones and I, I need to coordinate them autonomously. That's software, right? That's a software problem. Those hardware components don't cost anything. Um, so as things migrate to, to software, based uh, uh, systems uh, where the soft software is what wins, wins the war a lot of time, or, or is important, more important. That shifts the, the bent towards a Silicon Valley where, hey, we have all these engineers, like maybe they should be building things that make America safe versus like tuning advertising algorithms, which is what they do now at Google and Facebook. Um, so I think there's like a really magical thing that can happen here with like basic um, changes to these programs. 
because Silicon Valley, it does have sort of this strong muscle on putting in really good software people, raising money quick, and sort of understanding like how to build these companies. There's some good callus, callus there. Um, and then also, I think as you build a defense ecosystem, there's like incredible talent buried in these prime contractors, in these big companies. And like as you have more of a place for them to go, they'll, they'll st they start going there, right? So, um, so then, you know, a lot, a, it just kind of like marries the ecosystem together. Then maybe the prime contra contractors start buying up the startups that I described are going to run out of money in two years, you know, and like now they have some innovation, right? So, so I think there's just like a loop that can be closed a little more as we sort of break the, the sort of Cold War acquisition stuff that had its place, you know, in previous decades, but maybe now we need something a little more flexible. Hey, Marcus, for the record, I would like to enthusiastically agree with Alex that, yeah, you should be increased in size uh, dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> Low-hanging fruit. But one, Lo one, very point, low, yeah. one point to add on is um, a, a suborganization of DIU is National Security Innovation Capital. Um, that is an initiative designed to catalyze investment, dual-use hardware, kind of mid-stage. Um, and uh, we've been appropriated about $15 million over the last, uh, last year and, and I think this year. Um, so we made some investments, and we, what we found is 25% of those companies uh, have gone on uh, to raises, and uh, three of the, well, 25% have um, increased their valuation three to five X post NSIC uh, investment. So it kind of shows that, that value that Alex was just, uh, just described. The problem is we're not scaling it like we should. So we have a little less than 10 minutes to go. Uh, audience, I guess I got to start with Roger. <laughs> Mike, did you have your hand? I, I think it, Mike's got the first question on a lot of them today. Right? Um, Roger, I think this is where you say I paid for this yeah, money. <laughs> I hope that was a knowing laugh from everybody in the room. That was Reagan, John was quoting. Um, Alex, very provocative point that uh, it's a billion dollars what B, it takes yeah. with a B. I yeah. heard you loud and clear. Uh, dispiriting. Yep. And so I'm curious, with your recommendation that followed follow, uh, with Marcus's question, that if we get the bet from two million to ten million, how would that change your view of what it takes for a company to be successful? So would the one billion dollar number go down to something else if uh, Mike was successful in getting the bets to go from two to ten million? I think so. I, I mean, and yeah. where does it go? What's that number look like? Right. Yeah. I mean. Right, it shouldn't cost. It shouldn't cost what it costs to to build a semiconductor company a startup to to build a defense one. Um, um, but it does, right? So, yeah, I think I think as the as as those that part of it gets shifted, then there's just like this radical reduction on the risk curve. Because like what I'm seeing now are are companies that it's like four smart engineers. They don't have the DC person. I'm already like, where's your DC person? Uh, they don't have the fundraiser who, you know, you know, we can raise a billion dollars because we started Palantir when we were in college, right? So we have that credibility in the community around defense. The average person doesn't, right? They just got out of college, this kind of thing. So it's like, whoa, like this is this is crazy. Like how am I how am I gonna get anything done here? So I think it would just like smooth out the first, maybe like the first set of capital that has to come in and then sort of Pro, what's the right word, institutionalized or, or more, it would make these kind of very new technologies more industrial grade, where then, I think then, then, then the growth of the next, the, the larger investors, uh, I mean, it's like T. Rowe Price led our, one of our companies last round. Then they're in another group that's, 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 that's institutionalized, that's professional, and then we can have an industry, because like our job as the VC should be to, to pass the baton to them. This is a real company. Look, they had, they got a few real contracts, not two million. It's ten, maybe it grows to thirty or, or whatever. Um, or now we can invest in their second idea, second product line, get a few different shots on goal. So it kind of has to look a little more like you know, like an R and D center that that can have a few different things happening. I think getting that that first contract a little bigger makes it look makes us makes the investor VC community pattern match. Oh, this is like. They do real R and D here. This is a real product organization. This is this is different than these other things I'm getting pitched all day. So I, th I think it, it, it's it's close. Like we're 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 getting closer. Um, and then what I, I think what I'm saying is like 
there's a, there's a tidal weight of, of money that wants to come into this. Part of it is interest rates and defense is real, right? And like these, some of these other industries, crypto or, or things that distracted some of my peers the last four years, don't feel very real now, right? Um, so, so I think like, and then I think there's also a weird, like not going on a tangent, but like there's a history to Silicon Valley that's related to the, yeah, yeah. the federal government and, and like DARPA and, and the internet and like all of these, these things were, you know, East Coast folks coming to the West Coast, right? So, so I think like th there should be a, like sort of a natural reintegration there um, so, I mean, we're very optimistic that this is what's happening, or, or we're betting on that. Yeah. Do we have a microphone? Yep. On the end. Um, the, the capital s system includes the big primes, as you talked about, and the innovation system includes them, too. Um, there's a perception afoot that they have become less innovative in no small measure because of a, a short-term focus and the, 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 uh, the bugaboo of the quarterly earnings call driving. Is that a realistic uh, impact on their in internal investment and in innovation? And is there anything in this uh, scorecard or in this effort designed to <coughs> offer policy changes that might encourage something other than a quarterly earnings report? I mean, the startup perception on primes is pretty negative just because from our study of it, like partnerships with them as a startup usually don't go well for the startup. Um, you know, yet yeah, there's like these, I, I, I mean, like they can get better answers, but I think on our side, they're viewed as like sort of large and bureaucratic, um, doing cost plus, um, you know, where maybe we should have a system where you're like buying the product for, the, for a list price. It's not these ballooning budgets. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think that's also like you want to have like you want to have a set of new primes that come in and like challenge the primes and force them to, to to clean themselves up on the internal side, and make make better use of taxpayer dollars, right? So, on some level, you might you might get reform from primes on with competition, right? And right now, I, I think the perception is they don't have any competition, right? It's like what percent of the budget is just going to the primes, right? What percent is going into to newer companies that are like less than 10 years old, or call it, right? Palantir's 19 years old, he started when he was 21, I'm 40, right? So, you know, it's been around a while, right? And there's still, they're still like kind of the startup here. Um, I, maybe not as much now, but in the, in the past five years. So, um, so I, yeah, I, I mean, like, I don't know. Like, like how, do you, how, do you work with, how do you work with the primes? How do you reform them? I think there, that's more and more happening. I think there's like a utilitarian piece, like with Ukraine, then you're, you're gonna sub under their contracts and make things happen there. Um, you know, and then they should be buying, like I said, the prime should be going to pull out their shopping cart and go buy up all these projects that have real IP that are not going to raise a billion dollars, right? So there, there's, there's something there that I think there, there's some goodies in the goodie bag for the primes. Um, and then I think they get more, I mean, we're going to have, you know, ballooning debt payments and that's going to, you know, I don't know, but like there'll be pressures on, on how money spent, I think in the next 20 years. So maybe, maybe that's the area where 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 you know where they can do better but perception is is you're building startups to compete with them they're horrible to partner with um and we haven't seen a lot of success with that i'd say look modernization of the department uh, it's critical uh, if that hasn't become clear today but it's going to take all players from the primes traditional defense industrial base systems integrators uh the non-traditionals in the national security innovation base so it's going to take uh, everyone our authority to operate favors specifically favors non-traditional companies but it also provides provisions to work with the traditional defense industrial base and we have successfully partnered a handful of times uh, partnering uh, some of the non-traditionals with the traditional because um, it's all about scale uh, like I said our most important thing is scaling that technology uh, to the warfighter and sometimes those non-traditional companies don't have that scale up uh, capability on the timeline that we would need do you do matchmaking I, you know, I, I just think you're hearing from companies like Lockheed and the, the Boeing that the, the desire to, you know, reshape their corporate cultures and whatnot. And it does it does seem that we're seeing more partnerships, at least being in publicly announced. Now maybe they existed previously and we just didn't know about them. No, yeah, we um, I wouldn't call it matchmaking, but we we do when we think it looks like a good partnership, uh, we do do what we can to facilitate that. One more.
Jimmy Kemp uh, with Group 47. Uh, John, you referenced um, continuing resolutions and uh, with your experience in the speaker's office, what advice would do you have for Speaker McCarthy and uh, emphasizing how critical, critical it is for our nation's defense for Congress to get back to uh, doing the job that they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, do you have um, any hope? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think uh, the speaker gets it. Um, he was, you know, right there uh, driving the process forward the last time we were able to get a defense bill done on time. So I think he uh, intuitively understands the importance of, of trying to uh, be timely with these things. Uh, the problem, frankly, is one of prioritization. Um, there's always uh, a competition of lots of different things that could be the, the number one driver. And you know, the, the challenge for the speaker is whether, uh, you know, a timely defense budget is a more important priority than, you know, the other, whatever at that moment is the, the other competing um, uh, element. And so it's, it, it's not an easy circumstance. Um, you know, being speaker is a, a, a tough job, so I don't want to um, uh, criticize him. I'm just saying there's, um, and especially when I know he sort of gets the, the importance and, and really does understand the the value um, of having a stable defense budget and obviously the, the challenges we all face on national defense. So. All right, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists.